Meanwhile, in New Hampshire, during a campaign stop, Republican presidential candidate, former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley, was asked this question by an audience member. Quote, what was the cause of the Civil War? This is how Governor Haley responded. What was the cause of the United States Civil War? Well, don't come with an easy question or anything. I mean, I think the cause of the Civil War was basically how government was going to run, the freedoms and what people could and couldn't do. What do you think the cause of the Civil War was? I'm sorry? I'm not running for president. I, 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 I wanted to see uh, your That's a good thing. on the cause of the Civil War. I mean, I think it always comes down to the role of government and what the rights of the people are. And we, I will always stand by the fact that I think government was intended to secure the rights and freedoms of the people. It was never meant to be all things to all people. Government doesn't need to tell you how to live your life. They don't need to tell you what you can and can't do. They don't need to be a part of your life. They need to make sure that you have freedom. We need to have capitalism. We need to have economic freedom. We need to make sure that we do all things so that individuals have the liberties so that they can have freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom to do or be anything they want to be without government getting in the way. Thank you. And then in the year 2023, it's astonishing to me that you answer that question without mentioning the word slavery. What do you want me to say about slavery? No, um, uh, you've answered my question. Thank you. Next question. So, Eugene, uh, we can pick through that a million different ways. It, perhaps the follow-up question where she says, what do you want me to say about slavery? Um, is what stuck with most people as they watch that a commentary on Governor Haley, perhaps, but also about the state of the Republican Party. And as you watch the gears turning there, what she should and should not say in order to keep in order to keep her support. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And if you watch the crowd as things were going downhill, you could start to see people kind of squeam, get a little squeamish as she was answering those questions. You know, my family's always been from South Carolina. So I am very, very well versed on the conversation that happens. That was just there earlier this week for Christmas. Um, I'm very well versed in the conversation that happens versus, you know, whether it was states rights or slavery. What, what was the real conversation? So she's showing that, right? That she's a, she's a product of that conversation. This is also something um, in line with what she said before when asked when running for governor um, or in, in 2010 about slavery um, I, or about the about the cause of the Civil War. Obviously, it was about slavery. If it was about states rights, it was the state's um, ability to hold slaves. If it was about freedoms and what the government could tell you what to do, it was whether or not the government could tell you whether or not you can own and beat people, rape and kill them because they were your property. Right. That is clear to everyone who has eyes and has read history books. But what she is showing is the fact that in the Republican Party right now, there is not a lot of room for folks who would say something like that, who would be honest um, about slavery as the cause and the main cause of the Civil War. You know, you think about the last few years and what the Republican Party has focused on, um, the conversation about race in this country, their attacking of crit critical race theory. So there's almost no other answer that she could give in this Republican primary that wouldn't, you know, take some votes away from her as she is moving forward. I will say I got some texts from some um, of the staffers on the other campaigns um, <laughs> of this exact message when it happened. But then when I asked them how their candidate would answer, they got a little, a little um, pissed off at me and said, you would never ask them that question. And so it tells you that while they want this to knock her, they don't want to answer the question either. Jen, this shouldn't have been hard. Um, slavery is the answer here. Uh, but to, to Eugene's point, it is reflective of where the Republican base is right now, that you can't tell a simple truth uh, for fear of losing voters in what has become such a radicalized Republican Party. But let, let's take a step back and put this in the context of this primary season. Yeah. I mean, we didn't quite have a Ron DeSantis welcome to the resistance moment there, but at least he's telling the truth about what Trump is going to do very late to the party. You feel there. like DeSantis is actually saying now what he has always thought, but not yeah, the because his, 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 his campaign appears to be in its death throes. Yeah. So he's got nothing left to lose, I suppose. Um, but I wonder if this is going to this, this moment here the, last night, Haley and the Civil War, which is really exploding on social media. We had the Biden campaign weigh in and already also making clear it was about slavery, yeah. um, if this could blunt some of her momentum. 
Because I mean, it does seem like she has some, at least yeah. Iowa's always been hard for her, but it seems like going to New Hampshire, she did have the wind at her back. Maybe this cost her. It's breathtaking. I mean, I had read the transcript, but I had not actually seen it. And it is just breathtaking when she says, what do you want me to say about slavery? I mean, <laughs> that is her campaign in one question, right? It is like, who do you want me to be right now? In order, who do I need to morph into in order to never take Trump on, but be acceptable enough to sort of the MAGA majority that um, should something happen outside of my control, because she's not doing anything to actually beat Trump, I could be the person that inherits everyone else's votes. And this could be, so, you know, in, this is in New Hampshire, right? That New Hampshire voters they don't they want you to be courageous they like independent thinkers they want you to speak frankly this could you know so i think that it could hurt her um and you know if desantis's operation is effective they should be doing more to lift it up and make it a thing um but it also could have been a really big moment for her because she came on the national scene by becoming, by being the Republican governor who who took down or was part of taking right. down the Confederate flag over the South Carolina state legislature after the terrible uh, shooting, race-based shooting in Charleston at the AME Church there in uh, 2015, and that is when we, you know, first learned of Nikki Haley. This could have been a great moment for her to say, like, I came from, I come from the South. This is what we've learned. And instead, it, would, it is this panic. What do you want me to say about slavery? Yeah, it's that last line, what do you want me to say about slavery? Almost sort of defiant that she was going to refuse to say something there. So for the second year, Semaphore is out with its annual breakdown of the biggest political hits and misses of the year. And joining us now to take us through the Americana Awards is senior politics reporter for Semaphore, David Weigel. David, it's great to see you. I feel like I should be in black tie for this award ceremony, but this will have to do at this hour of the morning. So let's get right into it, starting with the best winning campaign, talking the non-candidate division. Who was it this year? Oh, that was the Ohio Coalition for Reproductive Freedom, the people who really twice in August and then November won by double digit margin these abortion referenda and, and Republicans, I should say social conservatives in in coalition Republicans had a year to figure out a strategy. They tried everything. They tried linking it to gender surgeries. They tried warning the with with ballot language is a little bit inaccurate how how far reaching this would be. It didn't work. You had a, uh, at this point one of the most efficient operations in center left politics. Politics are these pro are these pro choice campaigns, and this Ohio one was probably the most effective we've seen. And as you point out in the piece, August there was that first run to sort of stop the mm -hmm. way constitutional amendments are made. That was one run at it, defeated by 14 points, and then the amendment itself defeated by nearly the same margin. Um, let's move to best winning campaign, talking about an actual candidate here and an incumbent governor. Yes, that was Kentucky's Governor Andy Beshear, who started the year with the lead. He was the top priority on, on defense for Democrats, uh, on offense for Republicans. Republicans had Attorney General D Daniel Cameron, a rising star in the party, uh, who ha had to navigate a tough primary, but won it pretty easily with Donald Trump's endorsement. And you had, in a red state, with very bleak mood about President Biden, Biden's approval rating in some p parts of the state in the, in the, in the single digits, uh, Beshear able to win and expand his margin from, from four years ago. And he did so. Uh, there's going to be a theme this year. He did, he did so for a number of reasons. He, he talked about the state's economy, but he also talked about abortion rights. And he had uh, what I, I thought was the most effective ad of the year about a woman talking about her very gruesome, unpleasant personal experience with abortion, really befuddling Republicans who were on the hook defending a statewide total abortion ban. Uh, so good campaign, blocked and tackled, did all the right things, and also came up with messaging that I, I already within hours of the campaign was seeing other Democrats try to copy in other states. We'll, uh, Dave, we'll revisit that ad in just a moment, a little later in yeah. this awards uh, show. Uh, <laughs> but let's continue with the, uh, the honor roll here. Uh, best winning campaign challenger division. Tell us who it is and why it matters. Uh, yes, it was J Jeff Landry in Louisiana. Uh, he's somebody who did not make a lot of national news this year just for the dynamic that if, if somebody's winning by a lot, they don't get the same coverage. Uh, but this is a campaign that very early early on organized to replace John Bell Edwards, the popular outgoing Democratic governor of Louisiana, started with a simple message about, I'm the attorney general, I'm a former cop, I'm going to crack down on crime, specifically in the big urban uh, uh, um, precincts, big urban parts of, of Louisiana, big urban parishes. Uh, and 
did a combination of that outreach to Republican voters and outreach to black voters. He had very effective early ads directed at black voters in Louisiana who do not vote Republican mostly about how crime was affecting them. Uh, black, black victims of crime talking about why they supported Jeff Landry. Just the kind of very efficient, basic expanding, I should say, elect, uh, not just electorate expanding, but pulling in people who don't vote, vote Republican normally. Very efficient campaign of, of the kind we did not see a lot of in 2023. Uh, Dave, you have best losing campaign. That yeah. doesn't often get a good mention. So you've picked uh, the Glenn Youngkin effort to win back the uh, state legislature um, in Virginia. Now, this is something I paid attention to because I was, you know, there was worry among Democrats that he had a 15-week abortion ban that he was sort of putting the campaign for Republicans behind, and there was concern that if that was succeeded and he was succeeded in capturing the Senate that the Democrats controlled in Virginia, that this would mean that a national and, and a state like Virginia, pretty blue-ish, mm -hmm. a little tinted purple in there, um, that that would mean that that sort of that moderate position, you know, that this could be perceived as a moderate position that would do well in 2024 uh, for Republicans across the board. So I, you know, I look at this as a loss, but you look, you're giving Youngkin credit for almost winning. So explain why you think that was significant. Yeah, there's a little bit of the holiday spirit going on, but I'm trying to also correct. I think there was a lot of, of uh, obituary writing for the Yunkin effort after they narrowly lost these elections. They lost the, uh, the, the state house of delegates by one seat. They lost, they lost the Senate by one seat. That involved them losing seats in the house of delegates on a new map. The reason I say it was an effective campaign is because they won every seat in both houses that voted for Joe Biden by less than eight, eight points. So they won everything that was Republican. They, they really came very close to the Yunkin 2020 one margin. Again, I'm, I'm comparing this to what Republicans were doing around the rest of the country. Outside Louisiana and Virginia, there was not much out, uh, overperformance. They were losing in suburbs. They lost uh, They lost some moralities in Indiana and, and uh, other parts of the country where they, they, they were feeling confident. Um, in Virginia, they were able to come close to the, build this Youngkin coalition of uh, MAGA voters and some suburbanites, uh, not just around D.C., but around Richmond on, uh, in the Tidewater region. They were able to do that with a, hey, we, we are the Republicans. We're going to improve the economy. We also do not want to ban abortion. Or Democrats say we do. We don't. We want a 15-week limit. Because they lost, uh, there was not much of a conversation about how effective that was. It was fairly effective. It did, and I talked to Republicans afterward. It did give, encourage them that you can run in a swing house seat with a version of this message in 2024. Uh, they, they were outspent in the end by Democrats. I think they were hurt, frankly, by all the presidential speculation around Yunkin. You had very wealthy donors saying, we need you Glenn Youngkin to win these elections and then run for president, even with that complication, which scared up tens of millions of dollars for Democrats. They, they again, ran way ahead of their baseline, close to 2021. Uh, it was like the rest of the election, the Dobbs decision wasn't happening in Virginia. It just wasn't enough for them because it was such a Democratic state. All right. As we move to best campaign ad, we come back around to one you've mentioned already from Andy Bashir, the governor of Kentucky. It's titled Unthinkable Around the Issue of Abortion. It is a stunning ad. Let's watch it. I was raped by my stepfather after years of sexual abuse. I was 12. Anyone who believes there should be no exceptions for rape and incest could never understand what it's like to stand in my shoes. This is to you, Daniel Cameron. To tell a 12-year-old girl she must have the baby of her stepfather who raped her is unthinkable. I'm speaking out because women and girls need to have options. Daniel Cameron would give us none. Dave, so that's Hadley Duvall. She's 21 mm -hmm. now, talking about her experience when she was 12, being raped by her stepfather. And that really echoed well beyond Kentucky. She sort of, in many ways, became the voice of this abortion rights movement nationally. Yes, and that format of that is one we've seen a lot of since 2022, since the Dobbs decision, is Democrats finding a woman who can tell a personal story. There's not a rebuttal from somebody else. There's not a third narrator. The candidate's not even featured in it, apart from endorsing the ad. Uh, this is, I think, the most effective version of it we've seen, because in Kentucky, like I said, it's one of these states that had a ban ready to go if, if Roe was overturned. and You had an attorney general, Daniel Cameron, running for governor, who had defended the total abortion ban. I was, I was saying at the top of the segment, 
segment, um, it wasn't just this ad was effective and it humanized the issue. Uh, it, it totally scrambled his strategy. He started to say, well, maybe he was open to some exceptions if the legislature would pass them. He denounced the ad, but it wasn't quite clear what he was denouncing. He didn't have a good answer for, Dem for Democrats or really for the electorate on how situations like hers would not happen. I think a, a dynamic we've seen all year is that the, the Republican line on abortion for a long time, at least since 2016, has been, well, Democrats want no limits. No limits means abortions up to the ninth month. It means abortions on the on the table after a baby's born. Uh, what Democrats say is, well, look at what is actually happening in a, in, a, in a total ban situation. You have the contrast of a story that is happening. You saw one out of Texas uh, after the elections. And look at the, the fantasy Republicans are talking about of a healthy pregnancy being terminated in, in month nine. That's not a thing. That's not a thing that happens. It's not a thing that generates stories. These stories are real. And it's not just that Democrats are good at running ads about them. Um, they're realistic that this is happening in America. It is something that horrifies those voters who maybe they've got five or six reasons they might vote Republican. Uh, for parts of the ballot. Maybe they're angry about inflation or whatever. But on this issue, they know that Democrats are not in favor of total bans. And that really has been enough for Democrats to hold and take back a lot of ground uh, across the country this year. Again, with the presence of approval rating in the dumpster in a lot of these states. And you're right, Daniel Cameron, the Republican candidate there, had mm -hmm. no good answer for that ad because what could you possibly say to Hadley when confronted with that? Dave, mm -hmm. stay with us as you, if you can. We love this list. We want to take a quick break and then bring everybody the worst campaign ad of the year. We'll be right back on Morning Joe. Let's turn now to NBC's Steve Kornacki. As promised, he's over at the big board for a breakdown of what we can expect in next year's presidential election. All right, well, we are approaching once every four years, the big one, the presidential election year 2024 almost upon us. So let's take a look here at how politics have kind of and how the election of 2024 has kind of taken shape in 23 and the big questions we're looking at as 2024 kicks off. So first of all, who's going to be the Republican nominee, presumably against Joe Biden at the start of 2023? This seemed like a very uh, up in the air question. You can see the trend line for the candidates. And remember, at the start of 23, Republicans were coming off a pretty rough midterm. Term. Candidates who'd been closely aligned with Donald Trump had lost key races in 2022. At the start of 23, Ron DeSantis was running pretty close in the poll average to Donald Trump. And then look what happened. It just exploded here for Trump and went the other way for DeSantis. What happened right around here in the calendar? That was when the first indictment of Trump came down, the one from the Manhattan District Attorney. It almost seems to have triggered a rally around Trump effect among Republicans. And that's just held all year through all the legal drama and everything else that's happened. And here we are at the end of the year. And in the average, Trump just, you know, lengths, open lengths ahead of Ron DeSantis, Nikki Haley and Ramaswamy and Christie, too, for that matter. So uh, we'll see in the early contests if any of those candidates are going to have a shot here to beat Trump. They're probably going to have to make some noise, whether it's DeSantis in Iowa. He seems to really be trying to plant his flag there. Haley in New Hampshire. She's gotten some encouraging polling news there. Can one of them beat Trump in one of these early states? Of course, Haley, South Carolina, will play a key role among the early states as well. Can one of them beat Trump in the early states and make this a race? That is what we're going to find out in the first six weeks or so of 2024. How about the Democratic end of things? Joe Biden seems poised to be the Democratic nominee. What kind of year has he had politically? Well, again, he started 2023 coming off those good midterms for Democrats and his approval rating, you know, 46, 50 wasn't that bad, but it's taken a hit this year. And as we start to close out the year, our final NBC poll had him at just 40 percent approval, 57 percent disapproval. How does this compare to past presidents entering the re-election year? Here you can see it. Here's the 40 that we have Biden at right now. These are all the final polls heading into the election year, re-election year that NBC conducted. You just see all the recent presidents. Look, Trump got beat in 2020. He was at 44 heading into his re-election year. Bush Sr. got beat in 92. He was at 52 and heading south rapidly uh, there. But you see how that number compares. That's the lowest. That's the lowest in an NBC poll for an incumbent facing a re-election here. But it is a tight race when you poll Biden versus Trump at the start of the year in the average of the polls nationally. Biden at a two-point advantage. Now, at the end of the year, it is Trump who, on average, has a two-point advantage here. It's a very, very close race, obviously. Uh, and what are the concerns of voters, the dynamics we'll be talking about uh, if this race does materialize? Joe Biden, of course, is the oldest president ever at this point. Uh, and his physical fit, his fitness, his age, 
about three in four voters in our poll say it's a major or moderate concern. Big thing in 24 is going to be Trump's legal situation. Are there convictions? What goes on in the courtroom for him? 62 percent right now say that's a major or moderate concern for them. Would that number change if there's, some, if there's a conviction? Would that number change based on how these cases start to sort out? Big question, obviously, we'll be following well into 2024. And this is interesting, too. Just there is clearly what this ballot question is showing you here is matching Trump against just a generic Democrat. Trump loses sizably. Matching Biden against a generic Republican. Biden loses by double digits. It's just showing you broadly there's not a big appetite for Trump versus Biden, even though it seems that each party, at least as we enter 2024, is poised to go in that direction. And that leads to this final graphic here, a poll from a, a Wall Street Journal recently. They included a bunch of third party options and against Biden and Trump, they added up to 17 percent. That's a big question heading into 2024. Is there going to be a real third party candidate to create a wild card in this? Steve Kornacki at the big board where he's going to be spending a lot of time in 2024. Steve, thanks so much. Join it's just a few days before the new year, and we wanted to take a look back at some of the influential, groundbreaking women who we said goodbye to in 2023. They trailblazed a path for women in leadership from the White House to the nation's highest court and beyond. Here to discuss, MSNBC analyst and vice chair of the Forbes and Know Your Value 3050 Summit, Huma Abedin, and editor of Forbes Women, Maggie McGrath. Great to have everybody back together, whom I want to start with uh, former First Lady Rosalind Carter, who, of course, my family knew well. She passed away at the age of 96 in November. I think of her, I, I think of soft power, strong influence, and opening America's eyes to mental health. What do you think her legacy will be? You know, she really was a woman before her time. I mean, she was the most politically uh, active first lady since Eleanor Roosevelt. She was unapologetic about what she believed in. You know, long before Hillary Clinton said that she wasn't going to, she could have stayed home to bake uh, cookies and make tea. She said it and she did it. You know, she very proudly said she was more political than her husband. I think a lot of people who know anything about politics believe that uh, one of the reasons he was able to be successful uh, to even get to the White House was uh, thanks to, you know, thanks to her participation and her leadership. But, you you know, your point about mental health, I think, is really striking. I mean, she really mm -hmm. was talking about mental health at a time when nobody was talking about it. It was not a socially acceptable um, issue. And now, of course, we're, we're just beginning to talk about it. And she she led the way. And, the, you know, the, the other thing I have to share is I was privileged to be at her funeral. And it was such a testament to how to live a life in yes. and, lo you know, with love. I mean, to have uh, President Jimmy Carter there, who was himself in hospice, uh, sitting to honor her was so moving, so powerful and so inspiring. It was a real celebration. You are absolutely right. And Maggie, let's talk about Sandra Day O'Connor, who was the first woman to serve on the U.S. Supreme Court. She passed away earlier this month at the age of 93. How do you think, where to even begin on how she will be remembered, especially in regard to her remarkable impact on women's rights? I actually go back to the beginning of her journey and her career when I think about her impact, because of course, she was the first woman to sit on the Supreme Court. But when she received her law degree, she did so at a time when only 2% of American law students were female. When she graduated at the top of her class in 1952, no one wanted to hire her except one firm in LA that wanted her to be a legal secretary. She, of course, negotiated and bargained for more, and we are so fortunate that she did. In 1972, she had been a legislator in the Arizona State Senate, and she became the first woman to become the state Senate majority leader out of any state in the nation. Of course, on the Supreme Court, she was known for her centrism and pragmatism. She did not like the term swing vote, but she often was the decisive mm. vote on a very divided court, which made her the most powerful woman in America for much of her time on the bench. She was a crucial vote in protecting Roe v. Wade and judicial precedent for much of her time on the bench. Of course, in 1992's Planned Parenthood v. Casey, she joined forces with Justices Kennedy and Souter to protect the right to abortion and protect legal precedent, which lasted, of course, until 2022. And Huma, we also lost a longtime Senator Dianne Feinstein earlier this fall, and, and you knew her very well. Tell us about her lasting impact on women in office and her influence on you. 
Well, as we know, uh, Dianne Feinstein was the longest serving uh, female senator, senator um, to serve. And yes, I was privileged to know her. And I really think her lasting legacy is um, courageous leadership. I don't think, uh, I don't know how many people remember that her rise to power. I mean, she gave, uh, she was uh, sitting on the board of supervisors in San Francisco and was about to quit uh, politics when this horrible tragedy, the mayor and Harvey Milk were assassinated down the hall. And she, hours later, and she just rose to the occasion and showed what it was like, what it is like to be a leader in time, in a time of crisis. Went on uh, to, uh, you know, a very successful career in the Senate where she was known for bringing people together, you know, taking on uh, issues like gun control and civil rights advocacy. But more than that, she was willing, and this is hard, and this is something that she did really well, which is looking at an issue and deciding this is going to be my position, but being willing to change. So opposing same-sex marriage and uh, changing uh, her mind on that. She was supported the death penalty, changed her mind on that. She voted for the war in Iraq and then, you know, presided over, um, you know, the investigation into the treatment of prisoners at Guantanamo Bay. These were, these were challenging, tough things, but she was not afraid to do that. And my most poignant personal memory with her was in that very fraught, divided, um, primary campaign in 2007 when Hillary Clinton ran against Barack Obama and people will remember she was the one when it was time for that primary to end and, and uh, Hillary was going to uh, turn her support over to Obama. It was at Senator Feinstein's house in Washington that they met this top secret meeting and Hillary and I got into the trunk of a van and, um, and, and got into her house. I just remember her graciously offering wine to both of them, kind of breaking that tension and the ice and just such a, um, you know, an example of a, a gracious and tenacious uh, woman leader. What an amazing story. Um, so, Maggie, this year we also said goodbye to several entertainers uh, from Tina Turner, Sinead O'Connor, Lisa Marie Presley. How will the world remember them? Well, each of these women have a different musical footprint that they have left on the world, but each one overcame tragedy and struggle in their lives and I think will collectively be remembered for their fiery rock and roll personalities. Lisa Marie Presley, of course, was the only daughter of Elvis Presley. She was nine when he died, and she became the sole inheritor to his estate. She really became the custodian of his legacy. She did have her own solo career. It never reached the level that Elvis's did, but she never tried to be anything that she wasn't. She spoke openly about embracing imperfection, and what was being more important was learning from the mistakes you make. And then Sinead O'Connor was a powerful Irish singer, so powerful, I just used the present tense. And mm -hmm. she will be remembered as much for her musical voice as she will her political one. Mm -hmm. Of course, she topped the charts with her cover of Prince's Nothing Compares to You. And then in 1992, famously ripped up a photo of Pope John Paul II on SNL. That derailed her career. She never quite reached the top of the musical charts in the same way. But in 2021, she said that it was actually being number one that derailed her career and ripping up the photo brought her back to herself and put her career back on track and then saving wow. the best for last the queen of rock and roll Tina Turner she burst onto the scene in the 60s with the Ike and Tina Turner review and received acclaim and attention in the 60s and 70s through that duo act. They were married and it was an abusive marriage so she left that and it turned out that when she embarked on her solo career that's when she stepped into her power. That's when she became a global phenomenon. Maggie McGrath, Huma Abedin, thank you both so much and you can read much more about the women we discussed here and many of the other notable women who passed away this year at knowyourvalue.com. Joining us now, founding partner Puck and the former editor of The Hollywood Reporter, Matthew Bellany. Matthew, good to see you this morning. So let's talk through Hollywood first, beginning with the strikes, um, what it cost Hollywood, what it meant to the industry, and how it changes things. Yeah, that was definitely the story of the year in Hollywood, about six months of work stoppage between the two strikes, the writers and the actors. The actors hadn't gone on strike in more than 40 years. They made pretty significant gains in these strikes, both in wages, they got protections against AI. We'll see how that plays out. There are some minimum guarantees on employment for 
for writers that I think the writers think are pretty significant. But the cost of this strike was so significant to the overall industry. Some estimates of up to about $6 billion dollars was sucked out of the entertainment industry economy. And that's going to be the story of 2024 as well, trying to come back from these strikes. Production is now ramping up again, but we've had movie delays. The box office for 2024 is going to be significantly impacted. You as a consumer are going to notice in the spring when there are fewer TV shows. So it's a really tough situation that we're coming out of. But the guilds, the unions did make some pretty big gains here. Luckily, there's so much banked on streaming right now that I think we can survive until they refill it for us. Um, so, Matthew, let's talk about streaming. Obviously, it's where everything already is. It's not even where it's going anymore. It's where everything is. And Netflix had a very big year in that regard. How come they came out on top? Yeah, Netflix really pulled away from the other streaming services this year. They have this combination of scale. They have 250 million subscribers worldwide. This year, they cracked down on the password sharing. You may have noticed if multiple people mm. use your Netflix password that they politely nudged you to get your own subscription. Um, that worked. It juiced subscribers. At the same time, they started making these global hits out of random shows like Suits. Suits became a phenomenon. That was a show that aired on the USA Network 10 years ago, and it became one of the biggest shows of the year on Netflix. Wednesday, huge hit. And then Netflix, at the end of the year, started releasing the ratings data that showed us that some of these shows on Netflix, like The Night Agent or The Diplomat, these shows are generating billions of hours of viewing on Netflix. And the other streaming services just aren't keeping up to that level, so much so that they have started selling a lot of their shows to Netflix. You can now watch HBO shows on Netflix. You can watch DC movies on Netflix. Netflix is really dominating and, and pulling away from the other competitors. What was, I have to ask you on the Suits thing, because that became this phenomenon this year. As you say, it's a decade old show. Was that a Meghan Markle thing because she used to be on the show or what, what prompted that? I think it, it, it was a factor. You could put Meghan Markle on the little tile and people were like, oh yeah, Meghan Markle was on a TV show. Let's check that out. I think it also is just that it's a fun, fast procedural, you know, lean back, yeah. turn your brain off show that people like. And the Netflix algorithm really juices that. Once certain, you know, a, a certain cohort of people start watching it, they start serving it to other people. And then it becomes this big, you know, uh, viral thing that everybody is then watching. So I think it's, it's part of the platform and it's also part of the show. We also have to give a shout out to Peacock, growing very fast, and we're proud to have Morning Joe on there as well. Uh, Matthew, let me ask you about the Barbenheimer phenomenon. It was the story of the box office this year, and the the idea that movie that the box office the theaters were gone after the pandemic and everything else that had moved to streaming. Uh, this was a very big moment, was it not, for movie theaters in America? Absolutely. I think Barbenheimer really showed that the that nothing can dominate the culture like hit movies on a global scale. Barbie got to $1.4 billion. Oppenheimer, a movie that was three hours long, you know, largely in black and white, got to about 950 worldwide. That is a huge win, but it masks an overall problem for the movie industry. If you look back to 2019, one studio, Disney, released six movies that grossed a billion dollars worldwide. This year, Disney had zero. And the entire movie industry only produced two movies that got to a billion dollars, Barbie and the Super Mario Brothers movie from Universal. So that's a real problem. And box office overall is going to be about 20% down in 2023 from pre-COVID times. And the projections for next year are not better because of all these strike-related delays. So the box office has not recovered despite the huge success of Barbenheimer. Yeah, you, you can't count on a Barbenheimer every summer. Fascinating. So much at play in Hollywood and media right now. Matthew Bellany, thanks for bringing it to us. We appreciate it.